go to our Bibles. Um, let's go to Matthew chapter 1, first of all. I'm going to open this up. I want to show you some things from uh, Mormon religion. I remember years ago, it was... Uh, Boy, it must be 50 years ago that I saw this, uh, what I'm going to show you here, but I, show, I saw it on a chart. Um, the the uh, Mormons' Articles of Faith, okay? And I'm, I'm, there, there are 13 of them, and I'm going to go through them fairly quickly because I don't want to spend a lot of time on them. But uh, there's a couple that uh, I want to point out. A lot of these things that, that they say in their Articles of Faith um, don't sound bad. Especially when you think about the first one. The first one here is, uh, number one, we believe in God, the Eternal Father, and in His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. Do you believe that? Anybody here not believe in those things? Problem is, what's, what's the problem? Who knows? I mean, there, there's nothing here that you can see that's a problem. Okay? But there is a problem. Remember what we're reading. We're reading the Mormon Articles of Faith. So what do they believe about the Eternal Father? Anybody remember from last week? Well, uh, how, Let me go back here. How many of you have a paper? I think I handed some out last week. The Mormon Doctrine. Who needs one? Real good. went over theology. Theology is the study of God. Okay? So that's what we're talking about up there when we talk about the Eternal Father. What do they believe about God? It should be on that paper there to you. A God the Father. A one? He thought they, they, they believe he had a mom and dad. And he was once what? A man. Okay, so even though it says we believe in God the Eternal Father, they don't believe right. Okay, and then we're, we're going to look at His Son Jesus here as we look at the, the, the study of Christology, meaning the study of Christ uh, and uh, the Holy Ghost. So they believe these things, but they're different. Okay, uh, that, that it does not mean uh, what we think it means. Okay, number two, we believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. We'll look at uh, something about that in a little bit, but uh, no, we believe that. We're going to be, we would be, if Jesus did not die for our sins, we would pay for, try to pay for our own sins for how long? Forever, right? So we'd pay for our own, own sins, but because of Adam's transgression, sin came into the world. And we all are sinners. Okay. Um, number three, we believe that through the atonement, this is good. I mean, it's not good. All right. But it really points out their uh, part of what they say about salvation. We believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved. Leave that there? Fine. But look what it says more by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. What's that mean? They have to work. If they don't, if they're not obedient to the laws and ordinances of the gospel, then Jesus Christ didn't do anything for them. Okay, so it's... it's. Uh, uh, I said I wasn't going to spend a lot of time on this, huh? <laughs> okay. But I can't, some of them I can't... I, I can't say much that's bad about them. Okay, we believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are, first... Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, repentance. Now there's, maybe some people would differ with me on this, but there is no, you can't separate faith and repentance. They said first faith and then repentance. I guess you have to believe before you can recognize you have to, your, your sin's bad. Okay, no, that's, it's part of the whole thing. Faith in the Jesus Christ means you are repenting. 
Uh, third, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. Fourth, laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that, uh, that goes back to uh, where it says first principles and ordinances of the gospel. We talked about the ordinances of the gospel right here. So, uh, and, and number three. So number four goes along with that. So this has to do with their salvation. Okay? Faith in Christ is all you need right there. But <laughs> faith in the right Jesus Christ. Number five, we believe that a man must be called of God by prophecy and by the laying on of hands by those who are in authority to preach the gospel and minister to, in the ordinances thereof. That's a, that's, that's, there's nothing there that, that goes really against the Bible. But uh, anybody can preach the gospel because that's what God wants us to do, all of us. Okay. Number six, we believe in the same organization that existed in the primitive church, namely apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and so forth. Um, that goes to what they believe in uh, the gospel. The truth was lost at some point, and Joseph Smith was used, this is what they believe, okay, was used by God to bring back the proper, true gospel, and so that's what they mean in the primitive church. He brought it back to the right way. That's what he, they believe. Uh, this one, you think about this. We believe in tongues, the gift of tongues, prophecy, revelation, visions, healing, interpretation of tongues, and so forth. Do you believe in those things? Now, uh, be careful. Hmm? They're here in the Bible, right? So, yeah, you can believe in them, but I think what they're meaning is to, for today. Okay? No, a lot of those things are not for today. But that, but uh, other religions believe those things too. So it's that no different than some Christian religions. This one is this one is what I remember from 50 years ago when I saw these things. Okay, number eight, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. You see any problem there? They have two books. Look, the, is anything wrong with the first one? No. Not the book. No. Sure. What's that? <laughs> there isn't. But see, what they do is they say, as long as you interpret the Bible correctly, and we're going to see that uh, they use, and I've, I've said this before, and, and I know that you uh, um, might not have held on to the words. There's the two words, exegesis and eisegesis exegesis, you go to the Bible and find out what God tells us and bring it out from there. Eisegesis is you have a belief then you go to the Bible to prove it. Well, some of their beliefs are way off base, so when they go to the Bible, it's got to be translated correctly. So they have to translate it to fit their belief. So they, t they say it's got to be translated correctly, but when you get to the Book of Mormon, It doesn't matter. Just take it the way it is. Who translated it? Quote, unquote, who translated it? Joseph Smith. I, you know, I, I haven't gone into all the... There's too much to, to delve into in this whole whole thing, but I'm, I'm taking you to what they believe, not, not the history so much. But Joseph Smith said that God gave him some special spectacles in a sense to, to look at the golden plates and translate it from uh, some sort of hieroglyphics into English. So he translated it now it's perfect and you don't need to do anything with it. But it's not. They, they have the Book of Mormon and the Bible tells us that God said it. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. So we have the Bible and that's all we need. Uh, we believe that all that God has revealed, all that He does now reveal, and we believe that He will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Does God have to reveal anything more? No, He did it in the Bible. Everything He, he wants us to know is there. Um, I'm not going to go to, the, the, to, to any more right now. There's, like I uh, said, there's nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty. There's four more, but... Um, I want to get to your paper there and look at, uh, start on Christology. We looked at theology last week, and uh, we saw that uh, they talk about God 
uh, living on the planet Kolob. Uh, God had, had a father. Uh, he, he also has a, a spiritual wife, probably a wife with a body, in order to bear spiritual children in heaven. And that's who they say we all are, children of God and his wife. Uh, and we have received human bodies and came uh, to earth. There must be, and, I, and there's so much, again, that what, why don't we remember being in heaven? Uh, God washes our brain, I guess, before we come to earth. And so we don't need to know. That must be what they say, but <laughs> I don't know. So Christology, the study of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of Christ. Matthew chapter 1, look at verse number 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now let's read, I'm going to read uh, verse number 20, and then we're going to jump over to Luke, okay? Verse 20. But while he, I'm talking about Joseph, while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. All right, two verses there that point out that uh, the father of uh, Jesus was God in the form of the Holy Ghost doing the work. Go over to Luke chapter 1 and look at verse number 35. This is when uh, the angel... Gabriel came to talk to her. He says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. What the Mormons believe, let me read a few quotes, and, and I'll explain a little bit, okay? This is what Brigham Young, Brigham Young was the second prophet of the Mormon church. Joseph Smith began everything, and when he got killed, then they chose Brigham Young uh, to be their leader, their president. This is what he said. When the Virgin Mary conceived the child Jesus, the father had begotten him in his own likeness. He was not begotten by the Holy Ghost. Now that's that's blatant right there. He is not begotten of the Holy Ghost. Another quote, same, same man, Brigham Young. The birth of the Savior was as natural as are the births of our children. It was the result of natural action. He partook of flesh and blood, was begotten of his father as we were of our fathers. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says Mary was a virgin, and their belief is that God, the Father, <laughs> because they believe that Jesus is a separate being, a child of God, and who is, who is now probably a, a, a God in his own planet, God the Father took on or, or came as a human being, back in human form, and had sexual relations with Mary. That's their doctrine. That is against the scripture. So how do they get out, get out of this? How do they what the scripture says? I don't know what they do with it, but they have to explain it away in some point, some way, because of their belief. So they have to translate or interpret the Bible according to their belief because the Bible does not say what they believe. Isaiah 7:14 Let's go over and look what it says. Now you can, you, you can, if you didn't have the New Testament, you could make a case for uh, Isaiah 7.14 that she was not a, a, a virgin. But look at verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. What's Emmanuel mean? God with us. And, and here when it says virgin, the Hebrew word can be translated young girl. Uh, at some times you, you might see it in the Old Testament, not about Mary, but 
uh, this person was a young girl and she had never known a man. That means she's a virgin, but use the same word here. But it can be translated young girl. But because of what the New Testament says, the Greek word is only means a virgin. It doesn't mean a young girl. And so, yes, this was translated correctly because Mary was a virgin. She had not known a man, and we read it where before uh, Joseph and she came together, uh, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. She is a virgin, and if, if God came in a human body, she would not have been a virgin. And that takes away the whole, uh, the whole truth. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, look at verse 23. He, he quotes it. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And verse number 25. And knew her not, talking about Joseph, knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, uh, the Catholic Church believes that uh, she was, she continued to be a virgin and she didn't have any children uh, after Jesus. But this helps us believe and understand that she had more children because uh, the Bible talks about the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. And we know they'll be half-brothers because they all had Joseph as their, fa as their father. So Mary was a virgin. And uh, Jesus was and is God uh, in the flesh. So their belief on Jesus, when they say they believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, He's not the Christ of the Bible. Then we come to anthropology. Anthropology. And now what I have on your, your sheet there is talking specifically about uh, Adam at first. And this is what they say, that, that Adam existed before his creation, before you, you see the Bible creation, because uh, they believe he's called the Ancient of Days. Who is the Ancient of Days? God uh, or, or Jesus, I mean, both of them, because they, they have always existed. And so... They, they say Adam is the Ancient of Days. They also say that he is Michael the Archangel. And I know the Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. I've never seen a Mormon fight with a Jehovah's Witness, but I assume they could have that argument. But uh, uh, Adam, and here's, here's a quote from their one of their books, The Mormon Doctrine. It says, He, Adam, sat in the council of the gods in the planning of the creation of this earth. And then under Christ, participated in the creative enterprise. He helped God create <laughs> himself and the earth, apparently. Um, go over to Genesis chapter 2. And look at verse number 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Look down at verse number <coughs> 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he ma made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So for them to say that Adam existed, they might use the term pre-existence, but that's, we understand that that means before the existence that we recognize and see. Uh, he existed before, but that goes along with the whole doctrine of every person that they believe. Every person existed before they came to earth. And uh, even, and, and they take it, and there was a lady that, uh, and, and she was a nice, good Christian lady uh, back in Wisconsin, and um, 
she was like 90 something years old and she was still learning and she was excited to tell us look I have learned this from the scripture but she reads read magazines too and this one magazine which was a Christian magazine it wasn't a, wasn't Mormon or anything but it said because of, there's one verse in the Bible that says I think it's in Ecclesiastes when man dies the soul goes back to the God who gave it and it makes it sound if you're if if you're not if you don't consider everything else the scripture says you could say and think that God gave the spirit or the soul to man uh, and because he created it before the man was born and then when we die he takes it back to himself like he like as he gave it well he gives us life right when we die does our life go back to him no it just no, no longer exists so we have to look and see is that really what it's talking about he he gave the soul at one point and now he takes it back or when I was born I became a living soul there it is and it's not that he put he gave me a soul when I was created when I was conceived and you were conceived in your mother you became a living person and uh, God didn't have to give you something that was already created um, so Adam they say existed but it, they say that he sat in the council of the gods when they decided to create the world there's no place in the Bible that talks about that even if they if, even if he were Michael the Archangel never talks about that Michael being in the council so Adam is called also the ancient of days and uh, they say this about uh, the ancient of days all who have held keys of authority will give an account of their stewardship to Adam <laughs> I yeah, again I, they're making things up and they write it down and everybody from them this is way back this isn't something they're making up today this was back in the 1800s that somebody wrote this and they believe it because this prophet has said something but they also say about man man can become God a God I'll say it different man can become a God but there's special circumstances in order to become a God but let me read what they say about that endowed with agency and subject to eternal laws man began his progression and advancement in pre-existence his ultimate goal being to attain a state of glory honor and exaltation like the father of spirits uh, they call this a eternal progression as a person is born and lives on this earth he needs to grow in his goodness to become like God plus doing some certain things and part of it is marriage and we'll get to that a little bit later not tonight uh, they say in the full sense eternal progression is enjoyed only by those who receive exaltation exalted persons gain the fullness of the father they have all power all knowledge and all wisdom how can you have all power and all wisdom when God already has it you can't get it from him can't take it from him so you can't have it all that's what they're saying they gain a fullness of truth becoming one with the father um, they say that that exaltation which the saints of all ages have so devoutly sought is Godhood itself. How many of you thought that when you became Christians? You wanted to become a God. Did you did you think that was part of the part of the process? Is that was the goal that you were going to have? No. We were going to be with God the Father. He is God. He stays God. Uh, go over to Isaiah. I want, to, I want you to see these verses that that apparently they don't uh, <laughs> the Mormons don't get in here and, or they do and try to twist it like I said Isaiah 44 I'm going to finish right here and, and 
And that's where, as far as we're going to go tonight. But man is man. I'm a man, you're a man or a woman, and uh, 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 anthropos, the Bible calls us. We are men, the human beings. We can't be anything else. Okay? Um, Isaiah 44, look at verse number 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. Okay, look at verse 8. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? <laughs> Yea, or yes, there is no God. I know not any. No God besides God. Okay, now, uh, you, you, people could look at that and say, well, okay, at that time, there was no God like God. But, but we can become a God. I'm going to show you, I'm going to look at one more verse, two more verses. Uh, verse, chapter 45, verse 5. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. So there is no God beside me. Okay, people could say, okay, when he said that, there was no God. But as man progresses in his eternal progression, we can become gods. But now go back to Isaiah uh, 43. And verse number 10. This makes it pretty clear. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So who's going to become a God after God is already God? Nobody. The, the thing they do is what they they try to point out and try to make people believe this is, okay, what God is saying here, there is no God in this universe besides God. When we progress and become a God, we'll have our own universe. And so there's, no, there's still going to be nobody with God, nobody before Him or after Him in His universe. That's how, I guess that's how they do it. So why don't they just say that? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Change the, change the Scripture and say, in my universe. No, there's, God is God and there's no other. And we cannot become gods. But they try to make it sound that way. And that's what they, and they are so deceived. And I don't believe that the leaders are trying to deceive. They just are, they have been deceived and they keep believing it. And uh, it's a sad thing, sad thing that these people are trying to work their way to heaven and become gods and it's not going to work. Uh, they are going to end up in a lake of fire because they, I mean, if they continue in their uh, believing these things, uh, they are lost because of their doctrine. All right. Anybody have any questions? He had one. I can't answer it. Why don't they? Why don't they just say it that way? So if you have questions like that, I can't answer them. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are, Lord. As we recognize you as God, and there is none else, Lord, we we praise you for that because we have this uh, confidence that uh, you are watching over us and, and there's no way we can become like you. We can work at it. You can help us to grow uh, to be like you, but we know that we'll never be there, um, even in eternity. We'll be worshiping you, praising you, thanking you for what you've done for us and giving us eternal life. And we thank you for that now uh, as we look forward. We ask for your guidance now as we uh, go to prayer. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.